So what I'm going to start off with then is just a quick review of what we did yesterday. Um, there were a couple of different things that we learned. We discussed the various different data types that we are commonly going to use, namely strings and um, integers, although we did talk a little bit about Booleans and various other types of data. We did iterator or um, for loops where you'd go for a certain number of conditions to keep doing something over and over. We also looked at how to join elements of a list together back into a string or append new elements onto our list. And probably the most useful function in all of programming, we learned how to print our data to make sure things were going around correctly. So what we're going to do today is we're going to work with a slightly larger text. Now, that slightly larger text is going to be Tale of Two Cities, um, but we're going to start with a paragraph of it just so that you guys don't get overwhelmed. So let me share my screen. And we'll just jump in to a notebook here that I had already prepared. Um, again, I will, generally speaking, um, be moving through fairly quickly today, just because I want to make sure that you guys get a chance to explore all these different elements. So um, today we're going to start by cleaning up some data. Now, yesterday we had a string that was pretty simple. The time has come for all good men to come to the aid of their country. And if we wanted to remove punctuation or format the different words in that sentence, it's pretty easy because it's just a single sentence. But let's imagine for the moment that we have a much longer paragraph or in fact an entire novel that we want to do some research on. So for example, this is the first couple pages of A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, and so on and so forth. Now, if we want to do any kind of computational analysis on this, there's a couple of different things we have to do first in order to make it work. Um, one thing we have to do is we have to get rid of all of these capital letters. If we're going to try to figure out how often certain sentences or phrases or words appear, it's not really that useful to have a separate version for every capital and every lowercase variant of that word. We also want to get rid of all of the punctuation, because as I said yesterday, computers only do exactly what you tell them to do. So, for example, this Westminster has a full stop right at the end of it. So it will think that that is a different word than if Westminster was there without a full stop right next to it. The computer can't tell the difference. It can't understand what the punctuation is. So we do have to clean that up as well. And there's a kind of an old adage in any kind of data science, which is 80% of all the work you do in analysis is cleaning the data before you start doing the analysis. And that's absolutely true. There is just no real good way around it. And in fact, I really am glad there's no good way around it because you can make your data as clean and as tidy and usable as possible. And that way you don't really limit what you can analyze. You don't have to say, well, I'd like to ask this question, but the data is not in a good shape for it. So I guess I don't get to know that answer. No, we can fix our data so that we can ask interesting questions that we as scholars want to ask of the data. It's not a control, we are. So what I would like to talk about in is how we go about doing those two things, how we remove the punctuation and how we standardize the case. So if you go ahead to that link I sent you to the gist and you grab that paragraph, or if you have a paragraph of your own text, just kind of natural language, that's fine too. But the first thing we want to do is we want to put that in a string variable. So text equals, and within those two double quotation marks, I'm going to paste my text. Now, as you can see here, it's not liking this very much. And the reason it's not liking that very much is that there are all of these double quotation marks inside this text. So if you've got quotation marks inside your text, sometimes it can be useful to use single quotation marks, much like an academic journal, just so that it will understand it. Um, actually, in this case, ah, okay. So here is a good point. These quotation marks that are in here 
are not actually quotation marks, they are curly quotes. Curly quotes are the stylized axis character as opposed to what happens when you hit shift two or shift um, the pinky button if you're on an American keyboard. So I'm gonna put this into a string and that's going to run and it's happy. Okay, so this string is now in there. And I can test that really easily by doing print text and just making sure it reappears, which it does. So that's a good thing to know. Usually if you're using a word processor like Word or um, text, which is the open office version, it will use curly quotes because it thinks it looks nicer and it actually does solve that problem with programming quite often. So once that text is in there, now we have to decide which of the two operations we want to do first. Do we want to remove the punctuation or do we want to make everything single cased? Well, because making everything lowercase is by far the easier of the two operations, we're just gonna go with that first. And like the join or the append command, the lowercase command is actually available directly within the string itself. So what we do is we type text dot lower and then the brackets, which is the function call. Now, if you do that, it will run and it will print it. Essentially, everything is now in lowercase. But remember, just printing something to the console isn't actually that useful for us. We have to be able to do something with it. So we have to assign it to a variable. Now, we could just assign it back to a new variable like new text. But we're going to be doing lots of transformations on this text today. And we don't want to have like 7,000 variables that we're going to forget what they're called. So you could actually just reassign it to its own variable. So text equals or assigned text dot lower and brackets. So if you can all go ahead and do that. In this case, nothing will appear and that's fine because it's not printing it out to you. It's not giving you that as an output. It's just storing it back in the text variable. And if I want to double check, just in case I'm feeling nervous, I can go back and hit print text and there it is all in lowercase, just as I was hoping. Okay, so what's the next step? Well, the next step is to clean our data in terms of punctuation. Now, punctuation is a little bit more difficult to get rid of. And what you need to do is you need to use something called a regular expression. Now, I don't have time to go into regular expressions too deeply today, but they are an absolute godsend. I absolutely love regular expressions because what it basically is, is pattern finding. If you have a pattern of text and you can use these sort of um, macros or these kind of forms, and I'll show you in a minute what I mean by that, to find patterns and then do something with that text that matches that pattern. So in order to do that, however, we need to import a special set of functions. And by that, I mean, we have to tell Python to go get extra functionality from sort of a standardized library. So what we have to do there is to um, go ahead and type in import RE. RE is short for regular expression, and that will import all the extra functionality you need. Now, you're probably wondering, why do I have to import that? Why isn't that already included? Well, there are millions of functions that people have written to work with Python. And if we imported all of them every time we opened up a Python file, it would take 10,000 years to load or run any processes. So you just want to import the ones you're actually using that particular time. So hopefully you've all done that. Import tells it to import from a standard library and RE is the name of that standard library. Now, if you wanted at some point in the future to import a non-standard library, somebody that somebody had just um, provided you, um, maybe someone at your university is doing a project, they've given you a special library of functions, you can still do it that way. You would just put the file path to where that library is stored on your computer. But this is a standardized one, so we can just do import RE. The next thing we're going to need to do 
is we're going to have to create a regular expression in order to change our text. Now, there's a couple of different ways that you can use regular expressions, and I'm going to give you some of the examples here in this little bit of markdown. So anything that you put in a regular expression in these square brackets is essentially an or. So if I put in, for example, A, B, C, D, 9, 8, it will search for capital A's or lowercase B's or capital C's or lowercase D's or 9's or 8's. If you wanted to do all letters, you might do A through Z, that'll look for all the lowercase letters, A to capital Z, that'll look for all the capital and letters, zero through nine, that'll look for all the numbers. But unfortunately, we want to do punctuation. So we could do something like this, period, comma, semicolon, quotation mark, double quotation mark, question mark, and every punctuation we could think of. That's not very efficient though. That's not going to, we're always gonna forget something that we wanted to do. Another way of doing that is to basically say, search for things that are not these other things. So for example, if we say we do not want anything that is a word. Now word as defined by regular expressions means alpha, new, alpha characters only. It doesn't recognize punctuation. It doesn't recognize any um, numerical values. So that little caret or hat as it's sometimes called um, says, look for anything that's not a word. We also want to look for anything that's not a white space. So anything that is not a space. So why don't I just do that? Well, that is a single space, whereas this, We'll do double spaces, it'll do tabs, it'll do anything that's just blank. Um, it'll just do blank space. So for those of you who are coming in late, um, here is the written instructions that will hopefully catch you up to where we are, but we are currently um, just using the Jupyter Notebook on CoCalc to start our new project. Okay, so now that we've constructed this, it's basically looking for any word or any white space, but it's only looking for one. So once it finds the first word or the first white space, it's just going to stop. It's not going to look for anything else. So we have to put this little asterisk here, which says zero or more times. So every time it comes across it, it will count that. OK, so what does this mean? This basically means anything that's not a word or not a space that appears either once or multiple times. So it'll pick up this, it'll pick up this, it'll pick up that, set a punctuation, anything like that, and it will, um, it'll put that as a pattern, and then you tell it what to do with that pattern. So what do we do with that? Well, there is a simple formula for regex, which is regex or re dot sub and that's basically substitute we want you to substitute one pattern for something else and that has the brackets the way we normally do our functions now there's a very simple pattern here which is r quotation marks two single or two double comma x sorry x inside those quotation marks y comma z now all of these variables are very important the first variable is the pattern that we want to look for now the reason it's in these quotation marks and has this r in front of it is that we're looking for a regex pattern if you didn't do that if you just did for example this it would just look for the letter S. It wouldn't look for pattern finding. It would literally just look for what you put in there. That can be useful too, but not for today. So we're going to put our pattern in there exactly like that. So we want regex to search for this pattern. When it finds that pattern, we want it to erase the object. So we put in two quotation marks. If we put in an underscore, 
it would replace all the punctuations with underscores. If we put nothing in there, not even a space, it will replace every punctuation mark with nothing. And Z is the string that we want to do something to. So in this case, our string, I've named text. Now, if you try to run this right now, it will not work. And I don't want anybody to be upset about that. So I'll just do this. And it creates this um, lovely version of our text here. Again, no punctuation marks. Everything is in small letters. But again, we cannot simply just run the function. We need to assign it somewhere. Now, in this case, if you were doing this for your own test program, you might want to have them named as separate variables just in case you accidentally took out something you didn't want to take out. But I can see from this output that everything seems to be working the way I wanted, except for that. I'm not sure why that happened. Oh, they would have been hyphens. That's all right. So let's go back here, actually. I'm going to add not a hyphen. And let's see if that fixes it. Ah, yes, that's better. Never even noticed that. But then we have this. So it becomes <laughs> it becomes a sort of um, unsure idea of what you want to do. In the case of this, I think I'm just going to leave it as we had it before, because that will give us more information than we, uh, that's more of the information we want. So text equals regex pattern to nothing of text. Now we want to see how well our text did in terms of um, creating some kind of program. So what I'm going to do now is I am going to split up this text into individual words. So in order to do any kind of um, systematic analysis on these different texts, we need to have them not as characters, but as individual words. So we do what we did yesterday, which was text.split. And in this case, we're going to call it text words so that we are separating this list as opposed to the string. OK, so uh, I want to see if my text words has worked the way I wanted it to. So again, I'm going to do text words in a print command. But it's a lot of words, so I'm just going to do 0 through 20 to make sure that it's working OK. Yes, all of these individual words seem to be working. And again, they're all lowercase, and I don't see any stray punctuation in them. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to see how well our list works in a previous program that we did. Now. Yesterday, I wrote this in a slightly different way. Um, I'm going to show you my new program, and I'm just going to talk you through it. It's very, very similar to the for loop, but it does have a couple of different parameters. So this is called a while loop. Now, a while loop is basically like a for loop, but it has an if statement already built into it. So while something is true, keep doing this as opposed to do it and then ask the question if something is relevant. It's just a way of kind of combining a, a, um, a for loop and an if statement into one thing. So in this particular case, I create an empty list, a list of nothing at the moment. And what I'm going to put into it is that um, bit of data that we talked about yesterday, which was the name of the word and how often it appears. Um, in this case, um, I use an I as an iterator. That's kind of traditional. So we'll just start with one. And my little program here says, while I is less than the length of my words, so um, in this case, it's going to be text words. So while I is less than the length of text words, and and then so it'll do this program now whenever I is less than the length of words. So for example, I've got about 150. Oh, sorry, I've got about a couple hundred words in my list, and we start at one. 
So it'll go through when it's at one and then it'll go up to two and three until it hits the length of the list. If the iterator is the length of the words minus one, so if it's on the last word of the list, I want to add this little bit of information together into a string. And what this is, is the word before to the word after um, the word that we're actually on. So basically, we're making a three word phrase. And that'll make more sense in a minute. Um, once it's done that, it appends that little bit of text to our ingram list and goes on to the next word. And it keeps doing that over and over again. And so if I run just this little bit of programming and then I print our ingram list, you can see it's printing everything in three word phrases. It was the, was the best, the best of, best of times over and over and over again. So this is basically making a list of every three word combination that exists within this paragraph. Well, that's kind of useful. Now, what do I want to do? Well, the next thing I want to do, rather than print off that whole list, is I want to reset my i back to zero. And then while i is less than six, so I only want to do this five times, I want to print the ingram list. So if I do this now, you can see now it's all on individual lines because they're all individual print commands rather than just printing the list as it exists in the computer. Um, I could make this any number I want and it would just keep doing it for that number of iterations. And you can see how this really does lead to a, um, a pretty flexible set of programming. So um, before we continue, just to go through that again, a while list is exactly the same as a for list, except for instead of doing everything that's in a container, everything that's in a list or everything that's in a string, you give it a specific condition. And that condition is almost always an iterator. So while I is a certain number within this length of words, and you always have to have an iterator at the end to make it go up to the next number. And it will just keep doing this over and over again until this is not true. So for example, um, if I just add a little thing here, the length of text words is 1002. Sorry, an iterator is a number you use um, that basically just counts for you. So it's a counter or it iterates. It, it is a number that goes over and over. Absolutely. So this is our iterator. It's our number one. There are 1,002 words in here, which means the list goes from zero to 1,001. So let's put those numbers in here for a minute. So let's say this is a one. And is one less than 1,001? Yes, it is. We'll go through all of this. Now we make the i, i plus one. So now the i is two. Is two less than 1,002? Yes, it is. And eventually you'll get here where you're on 1,002. 1,002 plus one is 1,003. Is 1,003 less than 1,002? No. And then it will just stop. It's called breaking. It will. Um, just cease to run that little program and then it will move on to the next one in your code so that's the basic way that iterators work so if you have um, a certain number of things that you want to do that's a really useful way of doing it now i hear you ask if you want to do the entire list of words why did you not just use a for list for word in words well, the simple math fact of the matter is, is that I wanted to have this I in play so that I could say, what is the word before and what is the word after? There are other ways that I'm sure you guys can imagine having done that using iterators or other things. But for me, I thought this was an interesting way of doing it that would show you how to use a while loop 
and also get the functionality I wanted. So if we move on from here, we now have all of these little lists of words that are in our um, paragraph. And you can imagine that if you did that for the entire text, you would be able to find out really interesting things like how often does a certain phrase appear in my text? How often does a certain combination of a name, maybe you need a first name and the last name or variants of the first name and the last name, and you can see how those different things appear in your text. So this is a very simple but useful um, tool in your toolkit. Okay, so you've done that on a paragraph. Hopefully it worked out fine for you. But now you really need to work with something a bit bigger, something that's going to give you more interesting results than you as a human being could do just by looking at the text. So we're going to use the entire text. Um, for those of you who haven't been able to download it, I'll put it back here in the chat again, for those of you who came in a bit later. So um, this is a text file of um, Tale of Two Cities. And what you need to do to get this into your programming environment is to click on upload. So file, upload, and then click on this upload button here on the right hand side of your screen. And then you will be able to upload anything you have from your um, text. So make sure when you download it, you download it to a place that you can find it. And then once you're done, you simply go back to the tab that you were working on previously. If you've gone to your upload file here, at the top of your screen, you'll see files, new, log, find, and then the name of whatever you named your notebook, that's the tab, just like in a browser tab. Okay, so, You've inserted this um, file into your system. If you were doing this just on your computer with your own copy of prop, um, the Jupyter um, notebooks, it would just have to be in the same working directory as your Python files. The same if you were just doing this with a normal Python file, it just has to be in the same directory or you have to explain where in your file system it is. But in this case, it's in the same directory, so it just makes everything a lot simpler. And what we want to do is we want to open up that file, pull the data out of that file, and put it into a string. Now, that's why it's really important that this is a text file as opposed to a Word document, because Word documents are technically XMLs. Um, and you can use that with Python, but it's a different process. So we're just going to use text files today. So what you need to do is you need to put this command, which is with open file name r as file name. Now let me explain what all of that is so that you're not just copying me mindlessly. Um, what you're basically actually trying, this is a fancy way of saying that you're going to assign data to the variable file name. It is in a lot of ways similar to saying this, but because of the way that this particular um, function has been written, you need to write it in a certain syntax, a certain way the sentence is formed. So by opening this file name, and for most of you, that's going to be Tale of Two Cities, T-O-T-C, but name it whatever your text file is called. And then this little R, says I'm putting it into read mode. If you were going to write data to a file, you would put it in W, which would be write mode. But in this version, we don't want it to change the file. We don't want it to add or swap any letters around. We just want it to read it without touching it. So we put it into read mode. And we save that data as file name. Now, the file name data is not a string. It's a bunch of binary code. And while the computer can deal with that, we as humans are not so good at it. So we have to change it into um, normal Axie or you know, um, Romanized characters. 
So for this, I'm going to call it data, which will be my actual text I want to use, and file name read. And this little function basically says, take this binary and transform it back into text. And that might take a few seconds, depending on how many of us are hitting enter all at the same time on this server. Now, you're probably tempted to say, OK, print data. Don't do that. Don't hit print data. That is going to fill up your entire screen with all of Tale of Two Cities. And it, it won't crash, but it will certainly take a while to do. So what you want to do is print data with parameters. So for example, 0 to 200 just to get the first part of that data. And as you can see, the information has imported absolutely fine. Now, for most of you um, that are using this particular version, there is this Project Gutenberg tag information at the beginning and the end of the file. Now, this again is part of cleaning the data. If you were doing lots and lots of Project Gutenberg files, you would actually be able to write a regex command that would look for this Project Gutenberg ebook of, and this book is for the use of, you'd be able to find those and remove them programmatically. 